I, I think that this goes into what you talked about, about conflicting advice, because you'll have people who will preach the gospel of diversifying income streams. Then you'll have people who will preach the gospel of how um, that divides too much focus and people aren't effective at it. And what I don't hear people answering is more or less an effective way to build on top of what you're already doing by taking the way you're usually building your active income stream, your main income stream is usually people think of it as their time and labor, but it's really about their skill because the time and labor would be meaningless without their skill if they're doing anything that's specialized. So if you have specialization, that is focus. So now can I extract more from my specialization? That's what I think diversification is. I don't think it's spreading yourself thin. It would be if you were doing different things. What I think of is how do I extract more value out of the focus that I have in my specialization? Are you curious at all about the creator economy? Don't know what that means or are, yes, yes, Chase, I want some more. Today's episode is for you. It's yours truly and Roberto Blake, where Roberto unpacks numerous ways to make money on the internet. If you have an established business, he'll articulate up to seven different income streams that you as a creator might want to know a little bit more about. If you are uh, trying to understand your relationship between your job, your career, and your family, how to balance those things, today's episode is chock full of tactics from Roberto, how to make all this happen and more. We're talking about his new book called Create Something Awesome. <music> Roberto Blake, welcome to the show, man. We made it happen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Been a long time. It has. Congratulations on new book. Uh, yep. This we talked about before we started recording, right? Your I, I would categorize your rise as um, meteoric, but we all know behind the scenes that it's a ten-year overnight success, yep. right? So I'm wondering <laughs> if you can start out for those of those folks in the audience who might not be familiar with you or your work, uh, give us a little background and um, tell us how, how you got to where you are. So I, I think uh, where most of the audience would even begin to be familiar with me is probably YouTube uh, because I have over 570,000 subscribers over there, 1,600 videos uploaded over the last decade. Um, and a lot of what I do, I think, focuses around the creator economy, being a creative entrepreneur. And I, what I think I've done is I think I've documented my journey from being a full-time freelancer and coming from the background of graphic design, advertising, and marketing, and been building my own personal brand online across multiple social media platforms, building that reputation, which allowed me to become a public speaker, a podcaster, and now a best-selling author of a book. And Ultimately, what I've tried to do is help people like you and me realize that they can harness and build on their skills and that there are specific skills that they can be monetizing because the creator economy is the intersection of our creative work and creative abilities with the technology of platforms to scale that content literally lets us clone ourselves and go scale our value as creative professionals. And then we actually get to monetize it even while we're marketing ourselves. We're literally getting paid by these platforms to market our own personal brands and businesses. And I think people do not realize that. And sometimes they focus only on the monetization aspect of being online as a creator. And they don't realize that you're getting paid through that monetization to build your brand and build your funnel. Whereas in the olden days, you would have had to pay for access for reach instead of being paid for creating that reach and capitalizing on it. So it's an inverse. And that means it's the best time it's ever been to be a content creator, a creative professional, mm -hmm. an artist, a musician, a designer. It's the best time ever to be a creative person. Mm. Mm. I love that. That is like, I don't know if you practice that. You look in the mirror and rehearse that description, but that is fire right there. So this, the, the audience, as you know, you're familiar with the show, identifies as creators and entrepreneurs. But yes. one of the reasons, specific reasons that I wanted to have you on the show was be this the idea of how to go about doing it and specifically the last idea that you introduced, which is the idea of building a personal brand versus just the concept of monetizing. And I understand that I think both of us agreed that people often 
rush to try and make a buck rather than some sort of a longer term horizon, little, little investment that they put in what I would say into themselves. Yes. I would like you to articulate uh, in a little more depth, you know, what your points of view are around that. And for the vo- folks listening at home, uh, again, who already identify as creators, what are some of the steps that you feel like are most overlooked on the journey? So that's a great question. It's a great way to frame it, Chase. I, I think that what I like better than steps sometimes, because steps don't always scale and they're not universal and people can't always internalize that and apply it to themselves. So I like frameworks and I like keeping frameworks simple. So I have a four-part framework for this that I call um, reputation, reach, relationship, and revenue. And I think that that's easiest, the four R's. And I, I think when you focus on these four categories, you can build your own steps to succeeding in any of them, regardless of what endeavor you're taking on, because we ultimately build a reputation based on what we do. And that means that's about your skills. That's about your body of work. So you start with craft. You start with craft and you start with commitment to build a strong reputation. You can't build a good reputation without uh, committing to your craft, having a serviceable, acceptable level of skill in what you're doing and producing some level of results. Now, what people then don't realize the importance of, I think, today is putting your yourself in a position for the ability to enhance that through reach. And that's where social media comes in because it does no good to have a great body of work that nobody sees. It has no, it does no value to be this highly skilled person that no one's ever heard of. So the thing is you need to scale your reputation and what's going to accomplish that reach, which is why existing and communicating in the major social networks and media platforms becomes extraordinarily important. And that's going to allow you with that reach to build and have relationships you wouldn't already have because you can't be in every room all at once. But through content creation and participation in social media platforms and making evergreen content, for example, you can have clones essentially of yourself there going out, putting yourself in rooms you're not physically able to be in when people consume your content. Everyone listening to this podcast, you and I don't have to be in a room with them. By being on this podcast, I have reach that I would never have with people and lead to relationship. I believe they'll lead to relationships over the next year to two years that I would never have otherwise. So I feel that that becomes important and that that's why being able to be omnipresent through platforms is so powerful right now. But the foundation of it starts with that good work and that good character and the way that you operate because you can't build relationships with people if you're doing things that create a dubious reputation or a bad reputation. So the foundation of this is your body of work, the way you conduct yourself, your character, then you need to scale that with reach. That reach allows you to have these new relationships you wouldn't already have. You also get the opportunity for more reach by having the correct relationships. And that's going to, again, come from your work and your character. And once you have those relationships and that reach, it's actually not that difficult to monetize. You can also intentionally network and build relationships that you know will be people who refer clients or customers to your product or your book or whatever it is that you're doing, or the content of the content itself is being monetized. The content itself that's building all this reach can be monetized in a variety of different ways. I usually break it down to the seven streams of income for content creators. There are multiple sources or variations within those streams, but it's seven categories that I've been able to identify. And so that's the framework that I would use is because I think it gives people something to focus on. What am I going to have a reputation for? What am I going to be known for? How am I going to be perceived in the world? Great. Who can I build relationships with that also helps me generate revenue and increase my reach? What can platforms could I be specifically focus on that have the reach that's going to build the correct relationships. I can prioritize YouTube because of evergreen content. If I want professional connections, I need to make sure that I'm doing the correct things in LinkedIn. If I want omnipresent networking at scale, uh, Twitter, just don't be a douchebag and avoid politics Twitter and you'll be fine. And then in terms of um, a more emotionally driven or interpersonal relationship, or if you're building a lifestyle brand, or if you want to give people a peek behind the scenes of your lifestyle. Instagram is a great platform for it. So I think that you can contextualize this to fit yourself with a framework. And I think a framework is more effective than me laying out the steps that I would take because that may not apply to someone's circumstances. Yeah. Boom. (laughs) Great, great, great. So what I heard 
what I heard in there, I heard lots of very, very good stuff. And I, I want to put a pin in a few of them and come back. But one, you know, where I'd like to start to excavate a little bit is what I heard you do is prioritizing different platforms based on goals and based on industry. Um, how might someone, I, I just, the reason I'm asking this is, is I'm thinking to a question that I answered. I recorded a podcast yesterday, a Q&A. I don't do them very often. We took in hundreds of questions and one of the ones that I selected, someone is asking a question about a very specific platform. And what I've read in your book and seen in many of your online videos is articulating um, how to think about, go back to your point of frameworks versus your actual circumstances, how to think about prioritizing different frameworks. Do you have some rules of thumb that you might share? Because this is, again, this episode is very tactical. You are a surgeon with this sure. stuff. And so I'm wondering if you can help people prioritize how to think about their work versus, you know, uh, or relative to the vast handful of platforms. That all right. Available. So a good way to think about it is to, first of all, audit your available time. Now, the average person that either is um, working a nine to five job, 40, 50 hours a week, or even if they run their own business and they've managed to efficiently get their time to where they're working 30, 40 hours a week, not 60, like you know, some lunatics like us, uh, then they they have a reasonable expectation, in my opinion, if they're balancing things like maybe family, for example, they have about 15 to 25 hours of disposable time per week in a reasonable way if they're balancing their lifestyle and they're not like taking the scraps of their energy after 6 p.m. and then trying to grind something meaningful out of that. I don't think that's practical for a lot of people. I think there's a limit to how much productive work someone can do at a time. So I think that there's only 15 to 25 uh, productive hours in a week for somebody to be uh, a part-time creator building their personal brand if they have a full-time job or a full-time career. So I think that that's one the first thing to do is reasonably audit your available productive time. Not all the time you have is productive. I think that this is the cap for productive time to work on things. Now with that in mind, you can start to think about where you can maximize that the most based on your level of ability and skill now that we have the time availability. We know that YouTube content because of the nature of video, audio, lighting, lenses, scripting, all those things is extraordinarily time consuming, time intensive. And that if you have to start from the beginning, you also have to learn how to do these things properly on top of that. So um, there's a lot of overwhelm if you go directly to that. By comparison, maybe a live stream audio, you know, stripped out the audio podcast might be effective because it's live to tape, which means... It only has to consume what is allotted to it. And maybe even with your nine to five job, maybe podcasting for an hour, you know, uh, Monday through Friday or whatever might not even be that bad. And then the productive time, um, maybe on your weekends or your days off, whichever it is, is more effective for the business development and marketing aspects of things, which is why, you know, people we know like Pat Flynn podcasting was relatively, um, you know, audio only podcasting or live to tape podcasting, smarter play in a limited time framework. For other people, writing would be more practical in a limited time mm -hmm. framework because of what they're able to accomplish. And then they could be like Justin Welsh with LinkedIn because writing would be more practical and a better scale of time. It's massively evergreen. So they could approach it in that way. You can look at platforms. You can look about how often you have to post to really scale and be effective. But you could look at also the how intense the commitment to produce a good quality result is from a, a standpoint of what do you have to invest in terms of energy? What do you have left to invest in terms of uh, the commitment of time? But also what would you have to invest in terms of the uh, resources, materials, software, hardware that would allow you to compete and produce at the highest levels of quality or meet the minimum threshold of acceptable quality? So the lowest barrier to entry platforms, I would think, would be the platforms where you can write, aka like LinkedIn, for example. You could post high quality content there because I think there's zero barrier to entry outside of skill and intelligence and uh, aptitude there. But then going beyond that, I would say the next most affordable barrier to entry to produce high quality content consistently that's evergreen scales and has the most opportunity would probably be podcasting followed by live streaming. And then after that, you get into the video content creation aspect of things. Does that make sense when I say it? Oh, that's laser, laser. I love it. And 
part of, again, rather than the specifics, what I love about your work, when you, you coach others online, you're in your community, is you're talking in terms of frameworks, like even the idea of evaluating your, you're auditing your time, understanding what your you know strengths are, and then using that to focus on an area where you can be you know, minimum, minimum effective dose, basically, like, how can you do the minimum, but stand out in your crowd? And, you know, obviously, there's a, um, the goal would be to be incredible. But if you first evaluate these things, what's the bare minimum? Because what I hear is so many people talk about being overwhelmed, being unsure, there's all kinds of competing opinions from experts out there in the world, who do I listen to, when they tell me, you know, Gary tells me I have to be everywhere. And uh, then there are people who I know who only, for example, as you said, write on LinkedIn, and they are both making, you know, a lovely living for themselves. They are fulfilling their personal dream and ambition. They look fulfilled. They 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 seem to be um, pursuing their dreams, and yet they have wildly different approaches. And to me, that is that goes back to that framework and goes back to what are your specific interests, skills, and how do you honestly evaluate them. So I'm glad I, I you brought that up because, and oh, go ahead, please go for it. Go for it. The thing I want to say about that is I think that when people are consuming advice, they need to go to diagnostic instead of evaluative, meaning instead of trying to, oh, it's Gary Vee, a charlatan or blah, 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 like diagnose yourself and realize, does this fit me? Does this apply to me? Because what are my relative circumstances to what Gary is saying? How do I feel about this? What, what looks attainable and what looks reasonable for where I am with what I have. So I would rather people do a diagnostic on themselves and really get a better understanding. And Gary talks about this with self-awareness is you should audit yourself and really take a look at what you have to work with and what is reasonable for you. And then instead of trying to evaluate the validity of what someone is saying by other people's results who don't have your circumstances, you diagnose your circumstances and then you figure out whether this pair of shoes that you want to walk in actually fits. Mm. It's so true. Right? What people don't realize is Gary has like, I think 22 employees working just on the Gary Vee brand alone, putting all this content out there in the world. Um, and that was the last number I talked to him about. So and that was a while ago. All right. I'm going to put a pin in that. And I promise there are a couple of other things that I wanted to revisit in your sort of opening uh, monologue or, or orientation for us in the audience. So you have spoken at length, and it's a pretty regular drumbeat in your work, reminding people that most of the platforms that we just walk through, where to orient your time and space and how to do it, are things that are not owned by you. Yes. And you have also talked at length about how to uh, leverage those, but not entirely depend on it. So I'm hoping you can articulate a really clear point of view uh, for those listening on how they ought to think about that circumstance. Oh, well, that's actually a really good question. I love this one. So one of the things that I constantly think about is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And the reason I think about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is because it was an intellectual property that was crafted by an employee that worked at Montgomery Ward. Do you know that story? I don't okay. know the story. So um, I want to say the creator's name was Robert Latimer. I want I think that's it. I could be wrong. Um, sometimes names are not the thing that I am good at as much as stories. But the creator of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer wrote this children's book while he was an employee of Montgomery Ward. And before he left the company, he was able to manage to recover the intellectual property and own all the rights to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. They did not value it that much because, again, Montgomery Ward was focused, as it probably should be, on its primary business. It didn't understand and value the concept of this IP because it's like, oh, it's just a children's book. It's like, you know what? You wrote it. You begged us to let you give some time to write it. And it sold a couple of copies. You know what? Fine. You can have it, you know, God bless and enjoy your retirement. And so they let him go um, and you let him retire. And he took his IP with him. Very hard to do today as an employee for good reason, because what ultimately happened was he took this thing that he now owned, his intellectual property, and then he got with a, uh, you know, producer and they crafted the famous Christmas Carol, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and they split the rights and royalties on that. 
And we've all heard the Christmas Carol, the Christmas song, Rudolph, the Red Nose, Reindeer. We've all heard that. Then he takes the profits between the book sales and between the music royalties they started to get from owning all of the IP and invest in having an animation commissioned from a small animation company at the time in the 80s that you and I grew up with called Rankin Bass. And for people who are not familiar, every every one of your favorite claymation Christmas carols that were turned into uh, claymation films as a child was done by Rankin Bass Animation Studios. And for those of you who are real 80s kids, Thundercats was done by Rankin Bass, as well as several other hero properties. And so five generations of this creator's family have been eating and having college paid for and living a wonderful life because he owned the asset that he created. He owned the asset of his mind, his energy, his time. He ultimately was able to, in perpetuity, he and his family reap the rewards of owning his own work. When you don't have that, you don't have true legacy when you don't own something. And when we're on these platforms, we don't even actually own the rights to all of our own data, uh, Chase, you know, not to be political, but one of the things I would love to see is a data bill of rights for consumers and creators, because I think we should own the right to our own data. And I think that you should always be able to request at any time a backup of everything you've done on a social media platform and be able to have it within a reasonable time. And I think that you should also not only own the, you know, the uploads and those things, but I think you should own the analytics. I think you should own the analytics and own the data to be able to use and to be able to uh, deploy and to be able to learn from for as long as you want and apply in any aspect of your business. But when you're beholden to these platforms and your content only exists on the platforms that they are renting to you, essentially co-opting with you, they call you a partner when they monetize you, you split the revenue, they'll make you feel special sometimes by giving you better than 50%. But at the same time, how much control do you really have? Because what people don't understand is ownership is about control and ownership is about um, access. And the thing is, well, you don't own the data that you generated, so you don't own the knowledge that was gained. And yes, you're splitting the revenue and that's fair for what they allow and they provide you, but how much control do you really have over any of it? And they can also ban or delete you without cause. Uh, Again, they usually don't, there's usually a reason But just knowing that they can, knowing that it's not that different from at-will employment should terrify creators on these platforms, and they should be thinking about what their strategy or what their exit is or how they hedge against that and how they protect themselves. Because here's the thing. So you don't own the platform. If you rely on the revenue that the platform, let's say your primary revenue is sponsorship and monetization on platform, like say YouTube AdSense or something like that. Well, if YouTube decides to do anything or change anything, whether it's the algorithm or whether it's your access or whether it's any number of things, well, that compromises your revenue generating asset. That compromises the relationship you have with sponsors and brands. And you also don't have access to um, the data and you don't own the relationship with your audience. You don't have a means of directly communicating them and onboarding them yourself or moving them over. So what do you actually own? Very little, precious little. And that should be terrifying. You need to own the relationship with your audience and with your customers. You need to own the resources that allow you to deploy your work, meaning you need a way to deliver content. You need to own a mechanism for delivering content yourself. And you need to be able to obviously have control of the revenue itself. So if you don't own the relationship, you don't own the resources, you don't own the responsibility for everything, because that's the other thing. The platforms entice you by trying to take away your responsibility. But if you own the responsibility, you have control. So if you don't have the responsibility for everything, aka the liability, you don't have the relationship, and you don't own the resource to deploy, you don't control the revenue, what do you actually own? So if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think that you need to own your relationships, own your resources, aka the tools of your trade, the way that you deploy, and you need to take responsibility and control over as much as possible. And therefore, you're entitled to the lion's share of the revenue at that point. The revenue split and the division of the responsibility is an enticement, I think, to give up a large portion of ownership that you don't realize you're trading. And if I'm 
I'm going to insert uh, an opinion that I didn't hear you say overtly, but I think you believe, um, just, just to keep the conversation going in this direction, because this is very powerful and very useful. You're not saying to not leverage the benefits of these platforms, if I'm understanding correctly. You are saying be aware of the responsibilities that you share when you uh, sign up to those things and essentially be building in parallel other wholly owned channels that if the algorithm changes or the rules change or some billionaire buys a platform and it doesn't go well and they have to shut it down or whatever, whatever. happens. Is that fair to say? And if, okay. <laughs> Well, what I'm saying, yes, is and leverage the platforms, but most people don't, most people think they're leveraging the platforms. Most people are over leveraged by the platforms because they don't have enough of what they built in parallel to have the majority of equity in their brand. Most content creators, from my perspective, and creative entrepreneurs that are on platforms that don't have um, a business that exists where they have customers and a customer list outside of these platforms, don't have an email list outside of these platforms, don't have value outside the platforms to leverage for sponsors. If you have your email list, you have an email list of 30,000 people. And now you could do $5,000 a month recurring sponsorships with a 30,000 email list in a niche category. Um, I know people with 30, 35,000 charge $5,000 and get it for sponsorship in a newsletter, not for just purely. And that sponsorship, by the way, does not cross over to their YouTube channel or their podcast. It could. Even with a podcast, a podcast isn't centralized. So a podcast is really great, you know, and you and I both know this because it's not centralized. When you're on content platforms, even if you're being platform agnostic and repurposing your content, the thing is the initial content is still to some degree centralized. So if you decouple your monetization strategies from say platform revenue, sponsorship revenue, and you also, and you do effectively use them as a funnel, then you have much more leverage when that's the case. But if your primary revenue drivers are solely platform dependent, you can think you're leveraging the platforms, but you and you may be, but you're over leveraged because how much equity do you really control in your brand and in its operation and in its financial capacity? Now that's the second pin. I'm going to go to the third pin, but I think this is a good time in the show for me to say what Roberto is obviously dropping a ton of knowledge here. And if you're interested in a slightly slower version of this information where you can really grok what he's saying when he's using all of these terms about income streams and uh, you got to check out the book, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Uh, again, congratulations on the book. All this stuff is so well detailed. Um, and you've said something that, again, it's this, this thread that I'm going to continue Pulling sure. On. We've talked about platforms being platform agnostic, being you know having frameworks instead of um, in, instead of specifics. How to actually think about these things? Um, how to have a wholly a wholly owned audience, or to be able to work in parallel with the, the benefits that you gain from these other platforms? You talked again early on in the show about um, seven categories of income streams, and I'm yes. thinking back to that same question that I asked on. Uh, that the uh, AMA a couple of days ago that we'll, this, we're recording here right before Thanksgiving and it dropped on on Thanksgiving. If you want to hear my answers to some of these show to some of these uh, these questions, but when I'm thinking back about my answer, I'm dying to know how you don't have to give us all seven, but just I can. You, there there are a number of categories. I'm sure you can. You're like an encyclopedia man. This is amazing. But just give us uh, call it an introductory pass at the different income streams for those folks who are listening. Sure. Right now. With most people, I think they understand that content creators make their primary living, or at least most of them from sponsored content, AKA brand deals. The uh, little brother or cousin of brand deals is affiliate links, affiliate marketing, most uh, prominently the Amazon influencer program. But as you know, I'm a fan of SaaS affiliate because monthly recurring income that I literally don't have to go up and hustle for. It's truly passive. Like, you know, so SaaS affiliates really good. Um, you can always sell products directly 
You can also sell services. Both of you come, both of us come from a client services pra- uh, background. Both of us also have done um, digital products. You also have memberships, which gives you monthly recurring revenue. It's not passive in most cases, but it's monthly recurring revenue. And then you obviously have the uh, ability, if you do, say, live streamings, to do donations. So donations, direct fan funding through that, which I separate differently from memberships because I think that um, donations are something different because it's single transaction purpose without like a commitment. And then there's platform revenue, and this could be either ad revenue or this could be creator funds. Uh, so those would be the seven uh, streams of income there. There you go. This is where I'm going next. When uh, the diversification of revenue streams, especially early on when your business is less predictable, uh, is key. And do you feel that when you you know coach others or the folks that you correspond with in your community, do you feel like this is an area where people are well prepared? for the next chapter of their growth and development as a creator, or are they underprepared? I I think that this goes into what you talked about, uh, conflicting advice, because you'll have people who will preach the gospel of diversifying income streams. Then you'll have people who will preach the gospel of how um, that divides too much focus and people aren't effective at it. And what I don't hear people answering is more or less an effective way to build on top of what you're already doing by taking... The way you're usually building your active income stream, your main income stream, is usually people think of it as their time and labor, but it's really about their skill because the time and labor would be meaningless without their skill if they're doing anything that's specialized. So if you have specialization, that is focus. So now, can I extract more from my specialization? That's what I think diversification is. I don't think it's spreading yourself thin. It would be if you were doing different things. What I think of is how do I extract more value out of the focus that I have in my specialization? That's what I think about. How do I like, you know, use every part, like eat the whole animal, like use every part. And for that, I feel like you could take your specialization. Let's say it's um, something we're familiar with. Let's say it's uh, graphic design, for example. You have a specialization in graphic design. Actually, I'll do you one better. Let's say someone's a video editor because that's in, in the creator economy now, there's actually a massive opportunity for more people to become video editors. So if you're a video editor, you can make a lot of money by putting together a package, first of all, because now you're not doing an hourly wage. You put together a package, you're now in value-based pricing territory, like my friend Chris Doe would say, you're in value-based pricing. So you put together a package, and now the more effective and efficient you get, the more valuable your time becomes because it takes less time to produce a satisfactory outcome for a client. You get these packages, but you set them on recurring monthlies. So now you have a retainer client. You have multiple retainer clients. Now you have monthly recurring revenue. Now you have monthly recurring revenue. That's extremely practical. Now now this is without a membership. This is client services, but yet you have monthly recurring revenue without a membership, but it uses a similar model. Okay. But now, because you're doing video editing, you could also use the skills of a video editor and extract from that and say, I'm going to make let's packs and i'm going to sell video let's packs to people okay well how am i going to get traffic for these video let's packs well i'm a video editor by trade if you're a video editor by trade then you could say you know what i'm going to go on youtube and when i'm not doing client work i'm going to show some people maybe that are outside of the specifics of the clients that i work for so i'm not truly competing with myself or maybe what i'll do is i work on professional software what if i go ahead and teach entry level software or something like that. So if you do that, you can make money from the ad revenue on YouTube, but now you can also do affiliate links. Maybe you have affiliate links to a SaaS product like the Adobe affiliate program and the Adobe affiliate program. I think their SaaS affiliate is 80% or something for the first year. So now you have some recurring passive income from affiliate links. Maybe there are other SaaS things because you're talking to video editors that have monthly recurring income. So now you have monthly recurring income and it scales from the evergreen content of you sharing your skills as a video editor. You haven't done anything more than take your skill and say, I'm providing this service. Now I'm gonna put tutorials out into the world and I'm gonna double dip on the fact I get ad revenue and I get affiliate revenue from that. Oh, but wait, there's more. Now you could probably get a sponsorship from some software company 
or from Storyblocks or Epidemic Sound. And you can also do affiliate marketing with them and double dip on, oh, you're a sponsor. Well, I'm also going to get the affiliate link money. So now you're, you know, you're triple dipping. And now on top of all of that, you can also market and sell your own solution in the form of Let's Packs, your own sound effects, your own audio presets, bundles, et cetera, et cetera, to people who are never going to hire you to take it off their plate, who are fully confident they can do it themselves, but want to save a little bit of time. Because what'd you do? You resold your own time-saving measures. You're a video editor professionally. You have audio presets. You have Let's Packs. You have motion graphics templates. So the thing is, if you made these assets from yourself, you might as well make a variant of them and sell that solution to other people. And you can't do all the work in the world. So you're not empowering your so-called competition. You're a video editor. How many clients can you possibly work for in a month? So it makes perfect sense. You're not truly competing with yourself. And now you have five income streams from the same skill set. You've extracted the same skill set. And now you've actually enhanced that skill set because by making content, you're actually able to serve your clients better because now you have more empathy for them because you're making content and they're, and they're doing different content from you. But now you understand the considerations of YouTube content for the people that you're editing for. And now you also understand how their business operates and works and you understand a lot more of that. So now you're even more intuitive and now you're even better at your sales and marketing for pitching those clients. So what I believe in diversification is just learning how to best extract more value from the skill that you already have. And I don't think it dilutes you or makes you unfocused if you're doing it the way that I'm talking about. Okay. We have established now for any, any listener or watcher, there are lots of ways to live your dream life. There are numerous income streams. There are more tools available now than ever before. There are platforms that we can leverage. You don't have to own all of our customers. We would like to own as many as we can. There's all sorts of opportunity. You've made that point very, very clear. What we've talked about in the last 15 minutes is a lot about skills, the skill that you have, the craft. You opened, again, all the way back to the very beginning, you opened with being great at a craft. What you have just talked about, all of these different um, matriculations of earning revenue from different platforms, these are actually skills that you've developed. You've learned how to do these things from listening, watching, uh, taking action, making small mistakes over and over, getting better, refining that particular craft. So I'm going to zoom out now to an area that I've spent a lot of time in, uh, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on learning skills. Clearly, Roberto Blake has learned a lot over the past 10 years being in this economy. How do you learn? Where do you learn? What would you, what advice would you give to someone who just listened to you spray this knowledge and they're like, okay, great. I, you got me. I'm, I'm buying the book. I'm listening to this podcast again, I, <laughs> but I need to know, I need some direction on how do I go deep on some of these things that you just laser fired across my bow. No, this is great, Chase. Everyone learns uh, differently. Uh, you worked in an education platform that you built and scaled and sold Creative Live, which I was a customer of. And we both are in the online education space in podcasting and in video content and in YouTube. We both have written books. So I think what we both appreciate and understand is that everyone learns differently and everyone has a media that they consume for a different reason. And so for me, it's, that's why it's been important. And you were also another inspiration in writing a book, as well as our friend Gary and Pat Flynn and others. I think that you have to understand that everyone learns differently. And so I think, again, it goes back to the auditing of realizing how you best learn, but also how you best learn specific things. If I want to understand concepts, principles, and frameworks, the best thing I can do is to read, but also to listen. And so a lot of what I will do is I will find summaries on YouTube of audiobooks, and maybe I will listen to summaries even from different perspectives of the same audiobook to see how different people interpreted it. And I'll listen to that because now I have different perspectives until until something hits and resonates to where I can absorb that detail or that piece of it better and differently. So I'm not above the repetition. I think repetition is great, honestly. So I don't think you have to consume a book every week. I think that you could practically choose 10 books to listen to as audiobooks in a year that also are helping you develop a specific mindset or a specific goal or a specific agenda. And so I think you could listen to those books, but I think you could also listen to other people's interpretation and summary of just those 10 books 
multiple times. I think that that would be more effective and you would be better armed listening to five or 10 books on audio a year than if you tried to listen to or read a book every week. I also think that even if you don't feel you're strong at reading comprehension, if you force yourself to read a book, you might actually surprise yourself with how much better you're able to index, recall that information because now you've read it, you've heard it multiple times, you've heard multiple variations of it, and now you've also read it cover to cover but also don't be afraid to use a book as a reference. I wrote my book in a way where you can use my book as a reference and go back chapter to chapter. I even wrote the appendix of my book. I forget how many questions I uh, asked and answered in the appendix at this point. It might've been like 20 questions, somewhere between 12 and 20, but also you could literally just use the appendix and reference that and say, I need to look at that again. And then you could find another resource that lets you double down on that. So what I believe is I believe in deep learning, uh, Chase. So I believe in listening to something, I believe in reading something. I believe making my own notes and writing down how I interpret what I heard and what I learned or what I think I need to remember and writing it down. I also think that taking what I learned and trying to apply some lesson to it into my life that day or that week is important to execute on. What's the good to consume all of this and not create anything from it? So I think execution matters. Now, I think in software skill sets, I think that you should sometimes read principles like photography. You should read the principles. You should read a book by Scott Kelby on photography so that you can read why and how aperture and depth of field work, why to shoot at F4 instead of F2.8 in some situations. So that you understand concepts, principles, and uh, you understand the technicalities of something. And I love that in Scott Kelby's books on photography, he writes out little recipes for you in terms of doing something. I love that Terry White does that in some of his books on Photoshop and photo editing and design. I, and then I think you take that and then you, uh, you, right, you understand these concepts. Now you have to deploy them, you have to practice, and you might need to do a combination of watching people and hands-on. So you might wanna watch some Jared Pohl in Frono's photo and then see, okay, let me try to go out and do what Jared did. Or let me go ahead and edit in Lightroom alongside him and he provides you the files. That's one of the things I love about the way he approaches education. He provides you for free raw files that you can edit as a photographer and you could walk along with him, but then you could say, okay, I've walked along with Jared. Now what if I made my own tweaks? I followed his recipe. I followed instructions to the letter. But just like cooking, it's like, okay, I followed the recipe. But what if I decide I like it spicier? So what if I go ahead and I nudge a little bit here, maybe just a little bit more pepper, what would happen? So now you are being creative because I think that people are afraid today to feel like a fake by uh, copying or duplicating things. And I think that, yes, don't necessarily put that out there and claim it as your own. But I believe you should absolutely be copying and duplicating as a framework for understanding and learning, just like I had to in martial arts. You have to learn that because you have to do that until it becomes mechanical and you understand it. And I think for the tools of your trade, you have to repetitiously do them, but there's no point in just playing around completely in chaos with them. You should be learning the workflow and the framework of a professional that produces good results learn to duplicate their results as close as you can, then start practicing seeing if you can duplicate those results without instructions and from scratch. Then also start seeing what tweak, duplicating their work, but then making alterations and understanding those alterations looks like. So that's practitionership. And so I, I approached graphic design the same way. I wanted to, I taught myself, I went to community college, but I also taught myself graphic design and I wanted to get more advanced. So I was like, I want to do magazine covers and billboards and posters. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see if I can use uh, things I can pull from the internet and get as close to duplicating a layout. I would, I would go out and I'd go to Barnes and Noble, scrape together my pennies, buy five magazines and say, I'm going to duplicate the cover of these magazines. And then I'm going to duplicate I'm going to try to hand draw the internal layouts of these magazines by hand first and see if I understand breaking them up into something and building a layout uh, from like by uh, drawing it by hand. Then I'm going to go into InDesign and I'm going to try and I'm going to try to see if I can actually duplicate these layouts, throw in lorem ipsum text, find some stock photos for free online and see if I can basically duplicate this layout. I'm gonna see if I can find and match these fonts. I'm gonna see if I can get my type spacing and letting to be the same. So I, I would literally see if I could duplicate and craft from uh, scratch by hand the work of a professional. 
until I could understand how to get that result on my own and how to also start to think about how to make my own layouts and my own rules for typesetting and my own favorite font choices and so on and so forth. So well articulated. And I would like to uh, impress upon our listeners the rigor that you just talked about in not even mastering, but putting yourself on the path towards a comprehension of these concepts, the ability to deploy them at your will. Again, this is on the path to mastery. This doesn't even look like mastery quite yet. And what I find is people, because they see it so often, information moves so quickly, there's a belief that somehow Roberto snapped his fingers and became excellent at all these things. But if you recount, I'm speaking to the listeners or sure. watchers right now, recount what he's talking about, like building from scratch the cover of Outside Magazine with different photographs, How, like finding the font, applying the font, the drop shadow for the pull quote, the all of these things. When you heard about you know, authors from the 1900s handwriting their favorite novel. This is what he means. And I would ask you, listener or watcher, have you done this? Have you gone to this length? Or are you expecting results without doing the work? When you listen to your community um, share their their challenges, problems, uh, I'm wondering, is this a common one? Uh, are people seeking shortcuts? Or do you feel like now um, this is understood how much work's gone into putting yourself in a position that you're in, say, today? Roberto? The work is underestimated because there is an abundance of the end result from the greatest people in the world. And there's nothing deconstructing their process. And even if it is it's from an outside third party like me, um, it's an outside third party, maybe like Patty Galloway, who deconstructs uh, YouTube content creators. There are other people who deconstruct entrepreneurs and their success. But the thing is what people, even though people would not consume it at scale, what would be more respected would be the first party source. There's something I respect about you, Gary Vee, Pat Flynn, Chris Doe, first party sources of successful people that pull behind. And I've tried to do this myself is transparently transparently pulling behind the curtain, showing their thing. But the thing is, we're not necessarily the household names, so to speak, except for maybe Gary. We're not the household names. The household names are Mr. Beast, I Justine, Marquez Brownlee, Li uh, Lily Singh, uh, Michelle Carey. These are the household names, right? These are the people, especially the younger generation. This is the household names for them. For uh, folks in our generation, and we look up to uh, massively successful entrepreneurs. Some of them have passed on. We look at people like uh, Jim Rohn, for example. We look at the Zig Ziglar's of the world. We look at these um, large in life figures. We look at uh, a Steve Jobs. We look at Elon Musk. We look at a Bezos. We look at people and we go, I'll never be that. I'll never get there. And the thing is, we don't realize that it's not about that. It's about if we understood what getting there looks like, we would realize that even a, a, a fraction of a 1% of understanding that and applying it and getting there would be more than 99.9% .9 of people accomplish. And all we need is a fraction of that person's success to be dominant in what we do, in what we do, because we're not even doing what they do and going head to head with them. So it doesn't even matter to compare. But if we did have the understanding of what it takes, and we had a first party account of what it takes, we'd realize and audit ourselves and say, you know what, I'm not prepared to live that life. But how much could I benefit by living 20% more of that life? That's an understanding of what I go through is, and I love alchemy as a concept or as a um, mental model, is analyzation, deconstruction, duplication, enhancement. So that's like a four-step process. If I understood and I analyzed accurately what something is and what someone's success is, and then I deconstructed it to its individual components, its individual components, and then if I could mentally see from deconstructing those individual components, how to replicate the result, knowing how those pieces fit together. It doesn't mean I could necessarily do it, but what if I could? But also, what if I did that? And then what would be an enhancement on top of that? 
But the thing is, I could stop at the deconstruction of those individual parts, and I could sit there for a while and gain a lot of knowledge sitting just in phase two after analyzation of deconstructing something to its base elements, to its individual components. And I would realize those individual components might be by themselves more valuable for where I am right now, for more valuable than I am, and that I might never be able to reproduce the whole that made up the sum of those parts. But the, but those individual parts themselves could be so valuable that they would be 10x of where I am right now. And so it's about understanding that. So when you look at something and you realize, okay, well, to get Mr. Beast level of quality, that takes 100 people. I don't have that. I can't afford that. Well, Mr. Beast didn't start with 100 people. So when he started to improve, what did he have? Two friends, then three, then five. Well, how far did he get with those three and those five? The deconstruction. Oh, well, he got to a million like subscribers or 10 million subscribers with less than 10 people. Okay. Well, what if I got a fraction of that success? I'd have a hundred thousand. Well, what can I do with a hundred thousand? Better than I'm doing now if I don't have that, right? Uh, same thing. Mr. Beast made 460 videos. Most people don't know this. He made 460 YouTube videos to get to 10,000 subscribers. That's it. I made 800 videos to get to a hundred thousand subscribers. So the thing is, you, you never know. Uh, he made 100 videos. He didn't even get 1,000 subscribers out of that. I got more than 1,000 subscribers out of my first 100 videos. If you judged us too early in the timeline, I end up beating Mr. Beast if you judge us too early in the timeline. But that's in the timeline of like the work that we've output. If you judge us by the timeline of chronology, he's 25. He's accomplished less than 25. He's accomplished much more. I'm like 38. He's accomplished much more if we measure the timeline that way. So the thing is, you also have to account for how you're measuring your results, outcomes, and these things. So I think the lack of first party accounts of like the, here's me exposing exactly how the sausage gets made, how the result that you see. Because what happens is people in the beginning of their journey look at the results and that's all they see. And most of them do not have the ability to analyze and deconstruct. It should be done to some extent for them because then they would say, oh, it'd be completely unreasonable for me to compare myself to this person, that person, even if someone's a solo content creator, but they're full time, they have 60 hours a week of obsession to throw at something and all of their energy. They have all of their energy, all of their time, and all of their disposable capital to put into just this. If you're working class as a content creator, you're working full time on a job, a career, or school, you have 15 to 25 hours and the scraps of your spare energy, and you have other things divided for your focus to provide your income. So you aren't comparable and that's not competitive. And if you under, but you don't know that you don't think, and you, even if you see it, or even if someone told you, you'd have to digest that you'd have to internalize it and you'd have to gain perspective. It's overwhelmed to your question. It's overwhelmed. That's the big barrier. That's because they're lucking at other people. Then it's a lack of energy, yeah. motivation, money, and time, time freedom being one of the biggest. That was pure wisdom. Thank you for that. Two other topics uh, before we wrap up that I think I'm kind of saving some of these whoppers for sure. the end. So value-based pricing is uh, something that you mentioned, you know, you mentioned in, in parallel with uh, Chris Doe, for example, who's another person on, on the internet who does a nice job of, of articulating that. Um, we'll start there. And then I'll leave this last topic for uh, for the next question. But talk to us about value based pricing. Not everyone can do it based on their uh, industry potentially, or maybe they can. They maybe they can tweak their current paradigm or the industry standard paradigm to reflect something more like value oriented pricing. What is that, and how ought uh, our listeners think of it? So the the problem with charging in the hourly and wage paradigm is that it's actually the least advantageous for everybody on a long enough timeline. There's no incentive for massive productivity and working if, as efficiently and as fastly as possible when you're financially penalized for doing so by making less dollars per hour. So that's not even favorable to an employer. And so in terms of, oh, they're taking advantage of you with that, it's like not really because it's they're getting less efficient work. And the thing is, at their level, time and productivity for good results would actually be more valuable in most cases. So I, I think that that's something that people need to understand because I think the mind shift, shift has to be away from thinking about how am I being exploited versus how am I qualifying the exchange of value? 
So I think that even mindset shifting away from thinking about how to avoid taking a loss, you have to think about how is the most equitable exchange, equivalent exchange happening? And then what is the determination of that? And then how am I articulating that in a way that makes sense and where someone understands why this is happening? And it's not just a strong-armed negotiation. And I think that that's somewhat a matter of process and transparency, but it's also about refining yourself to, I think, feel um, and be someone who is able to communicate, demonstrate, articulate, and quantify and qualify the value of what they are doing. And I will, I'll I'll give you a primary example of that. Um, In the um, example we used of video editing per se, the value of hiring a video editor is not only the quality of the result probably being better that you than what you can do because the video editor is only focused on the video editing. If you have to film, record, edit, distribute, publish, market, that's a lot of your energy divided in a lot of different things. That's a lot of different things weighing on your mind. Whereas the video editor's sole task is to make the, if they're editing the podcast interview, let's say they're editing this interview, their sole goal is to make it the best that it possibly can be. And that is their only part of the process they're dedicated to. So they're specialized. So when you pay someone, it's not just that you're paying for their time versus your time, which also your time being freed up means that you can focus more of your creative energy on the packaging, the marketing, getting the sponsors, doing these things that would be worth much more money. But the thing is, it is essential that the actual work of the editing produced product, the podcast be done. So you're hiring this person for their specialization, the focus and concentration of their time and effort versus yours, but also you're hiring them with the hopes that they will also get better and better at this and more efficient than you are because this is their sole task and the thing that they're dedicated to. There's no amount of saving your money that is equal to that. So you understand that paying them makes sense. Now what they have to do is make the price itself make sense. But the thing is, all they have to do is communicate to you the same things I just talked about in terms of that value, but they also have to demonstrate a level of skill and competency that says that a level of skill and competency that says, I would never be able to produce this result as well as them with everything else on my plate, and therefore they're invaluable to me. And it's worth what I'm paying. But also you have to communicate your value in the sense of what am I known for? What am I what is my reputation? So your price, when we talk about value-based pricing, it's not just about the value of your skills. What's the value of your reputation? Are you known for delivering on time? That is valuable and that makes you a commodity in the market. I'm on time and I'm very fast and I'm very good at what I do and I'm reliable. Well, what makes you reliable? Here are the redundancies I have in place that allow me to be reliable. Well, can you prove your efficiency and speed? Certainly, give me a task, give me a deadline, pay my price, And the thing is, I'll deliver for you. And the thing is, you have the result. The result itself is worth something to you. Okay, well, let's go. That's a way to position it. That's not a hardball negotiation. That's as straightforward as it gets. So you can prove yourself very easily. You have the ability to say, well, you want to know how fast and efficient I am? Here's also my reputation. Here are the relationships I have. Here's who vouchers for me. Here's what I've done for them. You can see the quality of my work. You can see what the experience and relationship with me is like because you can hear it from these people's own words of what they got when they paid for it. So do you have the relationship? You have the reputation. Um, You have proven your resourcefulness. You've transparently uh, demonstrated your framework. It's like, oh, you use Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve. Okay, so you, all right, you're using professional software. That helps, that's thoughtful. Oh, you have a dedicated uh, process for video editing and you do these things. Oh. That's a thought. Oh, I hadn't even thought to question you about what the audio side uh, of your process is. And you transparently lay out what you do to enhance and improve audio. Wow. I don't even know what those things are. And I don't want to be bothered to learn them. You know what? You're hired. You see what I'm saying? There's ways to communicate your specialization, your value, your expertise, and you can frame it in. Okay. Do you think it's more important for you to save a few coins Or do you want to learn everything I learned to be able to do this that I've laid out of what I'm capable of? Do you want to invest in these things that I've invested in? Do you want to like, okay, nope, I don't want any part of that. So it's your problem. So I think by being, (laughs) and you don't have to over communicate these things, but I think if you do it efficiently and effectively, I think communication and marketing yourself is underrated 
by creative services professionals who aren't specifically copywriters or marketers. I think that they don't understand that the communication frame is important because you, you, it's not just about your skills that demonstrate your value. It's about articulating and communicating in a way that addresses the anxiety, the pain point, and the desires of the client. At least that's my perspective on it. That's a great perspective. And what I would uh, encourage folks to double down on in uh, their processing of Roberto's answer there is the ability to communicate with the people that you work with and for is dramatically undervalued in the marketplace as a perception. And in reality, I think, for example, I will reference my own career, being able to articulate and being able to point at a decades of delivering incredibly high quality photography at the highest level with all sorts of deadlines and constraints and uh, pressure, I'll just say, and then being able to communicate that value in the moment in advance of being hired, because in photography, for example, you get paid regardless when you're on assignment, regardless yep. of the outcome. So you, you can't screw up because if you do, your reputation will be trashed. And if your reputation is outstanding and you have delivered in times of crisis, then that is truly, as Roberto articulated in his example, invaluable, right? Because how many photographers on the planet or how many video editors, if you're using Roberto's example, can A, do that, but as important as doing it is articulating it to the person who's- Yeah, and keep a good relationship with them so that they're happy to refer other business to you and that they're happy to vouch for, for you sure. when you're pitching other people. For sure, doing it all with a smile and in a, in a way that is not um, confrontational or, you know, loaded with landmines. Even like if something goes wrong, even if something goes wrong, as hard as it is, you got to be nice about it. You got to be nice about it. Because the thing is, no one will want to yeah. hear your side of, you know, a, an unhappy client. No one will want to hear your side. No one will believe For your sure. side. So you might as well just be nice about it because there's no advantage other than emotional self-satisfaction of telling somebody off or writing that nasty email. There's nothing to be gained from it. Nothing of substance, nothing of real, real value. <laughs> that is a huge wisdom nugget right there as well. Um, all right. I promised that uh, I would wrap up with. Oh, you're one, fine. One, I've got time for you, Chase. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Well, it has to do with you have, again, I'm going to reference your book. Thank Congratulations you. again. Create something awesome. How creators are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. You detail paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, many of the things that we've walked through. And this idea of the creator yes. economy, obviously it is always moving, right? Things are changing, platforms are evolving, information's moving even more quickly. Skill sets are, um, jobs are being born that didn't exist five years ago. I'm hoping to get a little bit of mm -hmm. a prediction. I love As this. someone who's sitting here today thinking, thinking about getting like, okay, cool. I want to, I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to leave my day job that I like, or I'm going to start building my side hustle in hopes of building my personal brand and investing in myself so that in the future I can do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Any predictions on the future? Several, several. Um, for one thing, I think that content creator will be as normalized 10 to 15 years from now as today web designer and coder is. Because as you may recall, 20 years ago, it was not 20 years ago, and I write about this in the book. I was mocked by my college yeah, professors. The, the Enter with the book. The book yeah. My college professors mocked me 20 years ago in college, 2002, when I said that in the next 10 or so years, every company in America will want a website, will need a website, and will not be taken seriously if they do not have one. And I was mocked by these people. Again, they came from the world of leading rulers and T-squares and light boxes and typesetting, and they hated software. They hated it, that everything was Photoshop and InDesign now. They missed the old days. They were like, yeah, it's cool and it's faster, but no one will ever be as good at the craft as this. And they're, they're like, oh, oh, yes, we're going to teach you newspaper advertising. It's like, oh, well, look how that turned. I said that it would die. I said that it was like, hey, you're doing us this service. We need to learn digital banner ads. We need new web design and coding. Yes, print will be around, but the advantage and leverage for us is in the digital world. Why? I was a, I was living as a digital native for five years before college. Code Learned to code at 13. The average content creator now is learning to do video editing, 
some audio, some graphic design, is thinking about content creation, is looking at YouTube and TikTok right now, 13, 15, 16 years old, in the same way that I looked at web design and coding and graphic design and photography at 13 years old, 25 odd years ago. And the thing is, you couldn't get a degree 20 years ago in web design, specifically at most colleges. You could not become a web designer and get a four-year degree in it. It took years for them to catch up with that. You could get it to some extent in computer science and programming, but it was already outdated by the time you graduated back then. Content creation is no different. I'm hearing colleges. There's a college that actually partnered with Mr. Beast. I forget. I think it's um, ESU um, uh, or or uh, I think it's University of South Carolina or something like that um, near him. He lives in Greenville. I see them. Par- they're already partnering with him to teach social media and content creation. I've had offers from major colleges here on the East Coast and also on the West Coast to come in. This was pre-pandemic. Pandemic put the kibosh on some of these things. So now those conversations are starting again to come in and to teach some of these things because they understand the future. The creator economy is already a $100 billion a year industry. Chase, I think in 15, 20 years minimum, creator economy is a half trillion to a trillion dollar a year industry collectively. And when they say it's a hundred billion dollars a year, I don't even think they're counting online education. So as if they No, they're not counting education and they're not actually counting the arts, which are have their foundation. Which means it's already intrigued. like film and entertainment and all that. Quarter these so yeah, it's already it's already quarter already. trillion million minimum if they really were being honest. It's quarter trillion to half trillion minimum. So I think it'll absolutely in uh, 10, 15 years, or definitely in our lifetime, be a trillion, if not a multi-trillion dollar industry. So I believe that. But I also believe that the colleges will try to adopt this and say, hey, don't don't skip out on college to be a content creator. Go to college to be a content creator. They're going to, because they see that it is the number one profession in the United States of America for most people under the age of 25. That's what they would like to be. And they see a lot of people who are in their 30s and 40s, even leaving prestigious careers like lawyer, I write about Leon Hart, one of the first creators I ever coached, Leon Hart. Mm -hmm. He left his practice in being a lawyer to open Pokemon cards on the internet, and it's made him rich, and he earns more than every lawyer in America for the most part. And it's uh, on average. It's like like lawyers and doctors are making less than a YouTuber who left uh, the profession to open Pokemon cards on the internet. Ali Abdal in the UK left being a doctor to be a multimillionaire as a YouTube content creator. And he, he couldn't do that as a doctor in the UK. Their healthcare system is different than America. You can't do that as a UK. You don't become a multimillionaire doctor in the UK unless you're a surgeon. You, you, But he did do that within about five years through being a YouTube content creator. And that will be the outcome for everyone. But what I talk about is the fact that I think that more people are going to say, you know what? I'm going to do like an entry level job, not going to debt, be a content creator, double my income eventually by doing that, then exit my entry level job instead of climbing the ladder over there and make forty, fifty thousand dollars a year as a content creator and know that I own everything. And then they'll learn maybe to go from there, have the extra money. Doesn't take as much money as people think. They could like live modestly and then they go, okay, now that I'm a full-time content creator and I have this money, maybe I get a real estate license or maybe I buy rental properties because, oh, I, maybe I make 60K a year, but I live off of 30, 35. I take the rest, I start investing. Maybe they do that. They get real estate properties. Oh, great. I have cash flow. I have a business. I have this, I have that. It's like they're doing better than the trajectory of 10 years of traditional work, but they also have control over time, money, freedom, energy, relationship, all of it. And that's going to become more practical to people. And the reason I don't think my book will be outdated is I didn't focus on algorithms. I didn't focus on platform features. I focused on a lot of the core fundamentals, setting expectations, thinking of this as a true career. And I focused on the career development aspect of it. So my prediction for the future is it won't just be young people. More people enter the creator economy. This will become the entry point for creative professionals fewer people will see the need with how much education there is between free things on the internet, online courses, workshops they can attend in person. So more people will opt out of formal education. And frankly, it'll be because they've seen two generations now getting to massive debt, almost $2 trillion collectively in debt to not have these better outcomes that every statistic, outdated statistics promised them. And that doesn't mean they're going to get rich as a content creator, but it means that they're not going to have to go in debt to make 40, 50K a year, 60K a year. 
versus somebody who makes that or makes, maybe they make 10% more than them. They make 10% more than you, but they're six figures in debt. Who's really ahead here? So I think that it's gone become very reasonable for people. I think we'll increase the back end of audio producers, podcast producers, working in the background, editors, designers. I see a, a, a somewhat of a new renaissance and people might think that I have a very romantic frame of that. My frame is also based somewhat in cynicism. The pandemic showed us that people are dissatisfied, they're disgruntled, and that given the opportunity to have even just a little bit of breathing room, they are realizing that they can go their own way and that it's not the death sentence of being a starving artist anymore, which would probably be the title of my well, third book. Well said. Well said. If our parents had one job, we will have five the next generation. As Roberto just articulated, we'll have five at the same time and it will all make sense. This will be standard. Roberto, so grateful for your time. Thank you for being a guest. It's been a treat to have you. So tactical, so informational. Again, I have to point back to the book one last time here. Create something awesome, how creators are profiting from their passion and the creator economy. Um, Roberto, we know how to find you on the internet by your name. Is there anywhere in particular outside the book that you would like to uh, point our audience? I mean, the main thing is the book, but if someone does want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, they can go to awesomecreatoracademy.com. All the information is there, so I don't need to pitch anybody there. But the main thing is uh, you could work with me one-on-one, -on -one and I can contextualize what your circumstances are, what I think would be the most helpful for you, and we could help get you some clarity if you already are a content creator and you want to grow, or if you are a business owner who wants to use content creation to scale. The one thing that I ask is I try to not, uh, for very, I think, practical reasons, if you're not already... Uh, in a well-paying career, or you're not already uh, a content creator who's monetized in some way, um, I don't necessarily think one-on-one -on -one coaching with me is the right answer for you because I think that if you're not making any money with your content creation or you don't have disposable income, your best opportunity is to learn from my free content or to just buy the book, you know, ten, fifteen dollars. I think that's the best use of your energy is to get to the point to where you're making money yeah. from content creation. And then if you want to work with me, that's fine because then I know that there is a mechanism for you to make that money back in a reasonable way, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I'm not interested in taking the money of anyone who can't afford it or doesn't have a reasonable path forward. So that's all I ask is for people to just audit themselves and then figure out <laughs> what's the best use of their time and money. And I have a lot of free resources. I have a lot of affordable resources. Coaching with me is the most expensive thing I offer right now. And I, I would say that, you know, maybe you need to be making money at this before we figure out how you can make more. <laughs> very thoughtful. I appreciate your answer and I appreciate very much your time. Thank you for being with us. Uh, again, for everyone out there on the internet, um, huge grat debt of gratitude for Roberto's time. Please show him the love uh, by supporting him in all the ways that you uh, know how to do. And also this will be a benefit to you. So. Signing off for everybody out there in the world. Roberto, thanks again for your time. And until next time out there, everybody in internet land, uh, from Roberto and yours truly, we both be